Jason Johnson, uh, day eight of the Derek Chauvin trial, we're up to eight or nine current or former officers having testified against Derek Chauvin uh, that his actions were in no way, shape, or form proper, inappropriate, um, unauthorized, uh, unnecessary, excuse me, totally unnecessary, not part of their training. And so as I listen to all this, I think back to the last time we talked to you, and last week we had you and Tiffany on, you know, man, I was pretty skeptical um, mm -hmm. and cynical about whether or not 12 jurors at the end of this trial would all see it the same way and convict Derek Chauvin of either second degree murder, third degree murder, or manslaughter. I'm allowing myself, Jason, admittedly, <laughs> to be hopeful. The defense hasn't started yet. They've been cross-examining. They haven't started, uh, you know, but, but, and there's a long way to go. I, but I'm allowing myself to be hopeful. So I, I say all that to just say, you know, your take on the first eight days or so uh, of this trial and, and, and what stood out to you. Like, I haven't seen this kind of parade of blue since, like, Duke made the tournament, and that's been over a year or so now. Um, I mean, like, just the cop after cop after cop after cop after cop coming forward and saying the same thing. Fellow police officers, EMTs, the current chief of police, the former chief of police, current chief of police was like, I think Arando or Arenado, it might be pronounced the name wrong. They were like, this is murder. I mean, like they used the term murder. Um, you know, you, you had experts coming forward and saying, you know, you, you had his, his former supervisor saying, look, you know, there was no reason clearly George Floyd was subdued. You had EMT experts come in the last 24, 48 hours and say, look, the moment that you can't feel a pulse, you are obligated to provide first aid. I mean, there is not much that the defense is going to be able to do against this parade of his colleagues, of his colleagues coming forward and saying this is wrong. Now, I know yesterday they tried their little game of like, well, isn't it possible that George Floyd was a combination between being on drugs and a zombie who could come back to life even after you suffocated him, and therefore you had to keep applying pressure in order to make sure that that's going to fall on deaf ears. It, it can't counteract the fact they have yet, the, the defense attorneys have yet to trip up any of the witnesses. They've yet to trip, uh, trip yeah. up any police officers. And that, I think, is the key thing here. Like I, I told you guys last week, I think he's going to get convicted. I, I never had any doubt that he was going to get convicted, but it doesn't necessarily speak to any larger issues in our criminal justice system, unfortunately. Right. All right. Uh, All right. Look, uh, Doc Johnson, I'm going to ask you a question. And then after I get your answer, I'm going to tell you why I asked you this particular question. So from your experience, I know you know a lot of people. Um, who's the, the, the most thoughtful or let's say the best police officer that you've met in your life? Like, who, who is that person? Wow. The best cop that I've ever met. Yeah. Um, so I have like a, she like a big sister to me, uh, my big sister Carla, uh, her husband is a police officer. He's probably the nicest police officer I've ever met. I am highly skeptical of police officers as most black people should be in this country, but he's probably the nicest cop that I know. And, and the reason I ask is, you know, with some of the cross-examination as Michael mentioned, this notion that the crowd that the crowd, this 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 growing crowd, this swelling crowd, <laughs> may have caused a five, the officer people. to be a little disoriented. And uh, hey, they prevented him from getting right. George Floyd some help. And my 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 two thoughts were: one, if a crowd prevents you from getting help when you're doing that, right, you're probably a terrible police officer. One, <laughs> and then two, very closely connected to that is. The job, I know we're all skeptical. You're right. We're all skeptical uh, of police officers just I inherently, as, as mm -hmm. we should be. There's a healthy skepticism. Yes. Um, well earned. Listen, the job's not for everybody, right? No. It's the people who do it well, there, there's, there's an art to it, even if we look at it and say, well, that's still, you're still working for the state. You... You do some things that we don't agree agree with. There are some people who do it, and they can do it artfully. And some people just shouldn't be doing it. Some people shouldn't be doing it. Some people are just violent, unprofessional racists. And, and here's the other thing. 
the idea that the crowd had that much of an impact, right? Like, like, let's say, look, I was the younger brother, okay, in my, my family situation. But if my older brother is beating me on the head, and my parents are like, stop hitting your younger brother. What? What are you talking about? Stop hitting your younger brother. You're scaring me. I'm still punching. Like, when people tell you to stop doing something, when people are reacting negatively to the thing that you're doing, the normal reaction is to stop doing that thing, right? I don't care if it's like, stop hitting your younger brother, stop leaning against my car, stop peeing in the corner when you're drunk, whatever. People tell you to stop doing something, usually reaction is to stop doing that thing. So this notion from the defense attorneys that this crowd that is yelling at Chauvin, by the way, who is being protected by a phalanx of other officers, right? It's not like the crowd Correct. is right on him. But the idea that this crowd saying, hey, leave the guy alone. Hey, stop it. Hey, he's already on the ground. Somehow frightened him oh, but so they much called him, that he had They to... called him names, though, Jason. Right. They exactly. called him names. They were cursing. Hey, come yes. on. It, it upset know? him so much. He had to lean he's in profanity. more. I mean, <laughs> that, that was a, that's part of, Michael, that's the thing. That's part of what's so crazy about it. Like, I've always thought the defense, they don't really have a defense. And, 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 and nope. Chauvin is not a particularly sympathetic character. And look, unless they're going to go find Daryl Gates and Stacey Coons, you know, from, from, from the L.A. riots 20-something years ago, unless they can find some dirty cops to come forward, unless they can get, like, you know, Cobra, Dirty Harry, Demolition Man, unless they can get somebody to come out here and say that what he was doing made sense, I just don't see, I don't see how they can be successful. And they shouldn't be. Because it's a pretty darn common sense well, cut, and, cut and dry case. And it always was coming in. Uh, just on the, on the idea of the crowd. I, again, never been a police officer. But I think if he would have been in distress, I don't think his hands would have been in his pocket. Right. I don't think he would have looked as calmly as he did. And yep. I don't think that he would have stayed, his knee would have stayed on George Floyd's neck yep. until... That's right. The paramedics arrived and they had to instruct him to move. He was oblivious yes. to George Floyd. And Jason, I've taken it a step farther. Not only was he not bothered by this so-called crowd, I think he was performing for them. Oh, completely. I think this was a this was a counter protest. He was yes. mocking Colin Kaepernick, is my speculation. Yes. This was a yes. counter protest on the part this of this was... evil individual who was saying. Oh, you want to kneel in police brutality? I'll give you police brutality. I think he was, told, it, was I, it was it was intentional, 100%. It was a power flex. And, and I've heard, you know, both witnesses and analysts speculate that with his hands, first off, having your hands in your pocket while you're leaning on somebody is his difficult to hold balance. Yeah, exactly. I don't know what kind of downward dog he thought he was doing. There are people who speculate he was actually putting pressure on his own legs in his pants to keep the pressure on. And, and I will say this. I will confess to this uh, as, as a grown black man. I have had police pull guns on me three times in my life. Three. Mm. It takes very little threat, very little threat Correct. or perceived threat for an officer to pull his Correct. gun. So if Derek Chauvin felt in any way threatened, that gun is. He could out. have kept his. That's he right. could have kept his knee on his shoulder blade and had his gun drawn. They're trained to hold exactly. that position. So yes. if he if he were threatened, we would have known it. it all, and somebody else's gun would have been drawn. But yeah. going back to just the beginning. And by the way, Eric Nelson, Jason, the the next time he actually asks a question will be the first time. His entire <laughs> presentation has been, wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you say, well, is it fair to say he has not asked a question yet? Everything has been trying to get people to agree with him. In particular, right. the one that stood out today, which really pissed me off, was when they played the video from Chauvin's body cam. Mm -hmm. And he asked the, uh, the LAPD use of force expert, uh, the, the, witness, the expert witness for the prosecution, he asked him, right. is, doesn't it sound like he's saying, I ate too many drugs? <laughs> like, for him to... When, when nobody could make out what George Floyd was saying, for him to yeah. introduce that, that's where I catch myself wow. on what I said at the very beginning, Jason, which is, I'm still afraid, you said you say the last time you were on, Jason, I understood it, that, it, that the system sometimes throws us a bone, and yeah. that this one is gotcha. such an open and shut case, but, th but, the, but the system, it's the 12 jurors that concern me, that one right. of them is going to have such a a harsh okay. opinion about Black Lives Matter and be yeah. so protective of the police that no matter what, that they'll buy into the idea that George Floyd was all those things you described earlier. This this Jury number eighty five. Uh, hey, who was, you, hey, that somebody let me just jump in. You know.
Hey, hey, yeah, hey ahead, Jason. He just he just described juror number 85 before the trial started. Uh yeah. juror number 85 says, "Look, uh, I think sometimes you got to do what the police say and if you don't do what right. they say, uh, essentially you get what you deserve." Oh, That's somebody oh. on the jury right now. Yeah. I don't have any doubt. I don't have any, none of none of my assessment of this is based on any sort of inherent belief in the goodness of of those who are not like us. Uh, it's not a, a a belief in someone having some transformative moment. It is a belief in not just the visual image, but the inability of the defense to present a counter argument and and to make George in, in order and to make Derek Chauvin a sympathetic character. That was the thing last week. If you guys if you guys remember last week during the trial. Um, where he was asking his supervisor, the black man that you guys showed in the video before, defense attorney is like, hey, when's the last time you had to arrest somebody? When's the last time you were on the street? His whole line of question was like, yo, it's gotten rougher out there. You don't really know what it's like in these streets. You don't know what it's like in these streets. They haven't been able to show that Derek Chauvin was Vic Mackey, okay, uh, you know, or, or something else like that. Like, they can't show that he's this, this, this tough cop this but cop what if, that had to deal but with what if they're but what if they're sympathetic to police in general what if they're, Even if they're what, what if they're just sympathetic to the job not Chauvin, but just the job right the, you know if or, an, or anti black lives matter yeah oh, you yeah. can be sympathetic to you know go ahead yeah you can you can be sympathetic to the job you can be anti black lives matter this is this is both of the things that sort of work against them number 1 is you have so many different police including white police and white EMTs who mm -hmm. are saying this is wrong, mm -hmm. right? That's that's the key thing. Yeah. You have authority figures yeah. who are just like, who are behind this blue badge, who are saying, yeah, I thought this was excessive. That's that's the key issue here. And then on top yep. of that, that's George Floyd, yeah, George Floyd isn't a Black Lives Matter activist. None of the people coming forward were Black Lives Matter activists. These are just people trying to go to the local bodega, right? So. The inability of the defense to present this as a situation where, okay, look, this is a wild, crazy crowd. Their inability to show that Derek Chauvin is, is from the shield, that he's just that tough cop, and sometimes you got to do this, that, the other. He hasn't been able to show it. And we haven't even gotten to, which I think is something that really doesn't work in the defense, we haven't even gotten to the, the likelihood that, they, that he knew George Floyd, because they used to work security at the same place. Like, that's going to make it worse. Because if you can't connect that to a story, right? If Derek Chauvin was able to say, look, man, I used to work with this guy in security. He was a mess then, he was a danger then. They haven't been able to present that case. So you're telling me you knew this guy, you work with him, and then you, you leaned on his neck until he died? Did you have some previous reason yeah. to think so? Those are all of the things that the defense has failed to do. And I think everything from trying to convince the public or trying to convince the jury that the chief of police doesn't really know how crime works. Trying to convince, I mean, yesterday right. they were low key and this morning trying to suggest that he wasn't leaning on his neck, that he was leaning on his shoulder. Really? Oh, the shoulder really? Is this yeah. what we're doing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like, you know, yeah. I, you know, that's, that's what shows they're really grasping at straws. They're reaching. Here. Like I, I don't, oh. yeah, they're oh, reaching. The, the, this is a Dawson the, the, street. Like look I at him holding back the crowd. That, that one still shot of somebody's arm, you know, look, look at he's holding back the crowd. Like, he just had his right. arm. Whatever. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, <laughs> you know what, Doc, I, I, I want to ask you this, so I want to switch gears and ask you about Georgia. I, I heard Brian Kemp, Sorry. governor of Georgia, you know, talking <laughs> about uh, the Atlanta Braves in the city of Atlanta losing the MLB All-Star game, and he said something about this liberal disinformation campaign and the liberal lies <laughs> that are out there. Now, I'm learning. I'm trying to be a fair man. So you talk <laughs> about the counter argument. I cannot on my own. I need somebody with your credentials and your intelligence to give me a counter argument. So I because I, I, I'm on <laughs> I'm on the side. I'm anti I'm anti Georgia all the way. But tell me <laughs> the argument that Republicans could make Make it make sense for me so I can understand it, where they're coming from. So here's the argument from Brian Kemp's position. I don't want to lose my job. That's his <laughs> argument. He's going to lose his job. Okay? 2022. <laughs> exactly. That's what he's worried about. Look, nobody in the state respects him anymore. The Republicans don't like him because he didn't sell out 
enough to Trump. A lot of Democrats obviously didn't like him because they thought that he was a cheater, he was unprofessional, incompetent. And independents don't like him because he keeps making a mess of things instead of just doing his darn job. So he thought he was going to split the baby and say, all right, look, let me do a little Trumpism here and let me try and reframe this as voter expansion there and maybe I can clean up my act. Here's what is going on with him. And I've said this from, from all along, guys. Brian Kemp is terrified that he's going to get primary. And the Republican Party in Georgia is terrified that he will be the nominee because they think he's going to lose to Stacey Abrams. That's what this whole thing is about. That's what he's trying to do. The problem with Delta Airlines and Coca-Cola and all these other businesses is they've got brand awareness to worry about. Delta don't need this smoke. They don't need this hassle. And this is the second or third time that the Republicans in that state have decided to pick a fight with their state's biggest employer. And I want to make this clear because I think a lot of people don't understand this. One, the Atlanta Braves are, are ridiculous. I mean, like I said, shutting up is yeah. free. Shutting yeah. up is easy. They shouldn't have said anything. It's idiotic. And nobody else should be saying anything about this. Let this happen, right? Like like the Houston Texans, they ain't got nothing to say about Deshaun Watson, MLB, whatever it is that Goodell does. Keep your mouth quiet. Let the league take the heat. You move on. But here's the underlying issue here. Raphael Warnock, John Ossoff, and Stacey Abrams, the three most prominent Democratic politicians or want to be politicians in the state, have all come forward and publicly said, we don't want to boycott. They've been very clear that they don't want to boycott. So if the prominent politicians who are Democrats are saying, we don't want to boycott, Brian Kemp ain't got nobody else to blame except for himself. That's the mm. issue. He's causing his own problems. Stacey Abrams is out there saying, I don't think a boycott is a good idea. Stacey Abrams has publicly said, look, I wish, actual words, I wish MLB would reconsider. So the Republicans yeah. have, have, have created their own trap here because they can't say this is the woke patrol trying to snatch jobs out of working class black people who are in and around the city. This is all on Brian Kemp's behalf. And the more he does this and the more these Republicans say, oh, well, if you won't do what we're going to do. We're going to take your cat tax cuts. All that does is make Delta and Coca-Cola and every other big business say, you know what? I don't even want to mess with you. I'm going to give my money to Stacey. Because well, you know get what? At least she knows how to get out of my hair. Well, and again, the All Star. Nobody's entitled to the All Star game. It's an exhibition. They didn't move the Braves. You know, like right. they'd be like, "Oh, you're right. taking $100 million out of your pocket." It's $100 million you didn't have, and 29 no, no, other no, no, markets no. didn't have anyway. So it's let me let me be clear, Michael. No, they didn't. They didn't move the Braves. The Braves moved themselves. Okay, and nobody really likes the Cobb County Braves well, yeah. anymore anyway because yeah. they ain't the yeah. Atlanta yeah. Braves no more too. because they <laughs> decided they wanted to move out to Cobb <laughs> County. So right. Let me be real about that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Touche. But but here's the other thing. So this isn't just a Georgia issue anymore. This has become part of the national culture war because whether right. it's Greg Abbott decided, well, I'm not, we don't want the all-star game. We don't want that money, and I'm not going to throw out the first pitch. Or Rand Paul or Marco Rubio or even Mitch McConnell somehow actually thinking it made sense to tell businesses to stay out of politics. Um, so <laughs> I, I guess... What does <laughs> I mean? What else can you do other than snicker, right? But, I mean, yeah. but, but from a larger <laughs> national, but but from a national perspective, I guess what is this? What does this mean now? Well, well, here's what this Not means. Just it means the, yeah, the Republican Party have put themselves in a bind. Because here's the thing: it costs Delta nothing to make a statement, right? It costs. Coke isn't say, you know, it, it doesn't cost these corporations to make public statements about local policy. So what you're doing by Mitch McConnell and Rubio and all these other guys attacking these corporations, they're attacking them for doing essentially nothing, which actually increases the power and influence of their statements. All Mitch McConnell had to say was like, you know what, I'm disappointed in Delta Airlines. Keep it moving. Marco Rubio just says, hey, I'm disappointed in Coca-Cola. Keep it moving. But instead, they're going to do this ridiculous thing where they're going to subject themselves to, to, to boycotts. Now I'm going to drink Pepsi. If you're going to force yourself to drink Pepsi because you're that mad at Coke, you deserve the rotted teeth that you get. Sorry, I'm a Coke guy. I'm not a Pepsi guy. But th this is this is what I'm talking about. Like the, the, <laughs> whole, the whole process that they're going through doesn't make any sense. And here's the thing. The difference is... The Republicans can't enforce what they're criticizing without shooting themselves in the foot. 
what are you going to do? You're going to try right. to take back all those tax cuts in the middle of a recession because you're mad about a freaking all-star game? They can't do anything policy-wise to any of these businesses. And now what the businesses are looking at, see, initially they had this concern of like, yo, this is going to hurt my brand equity if I'm Microsoft, if I'm, if I'm you know, this company or that company. Right. Now they're like, well, wait a minute. Mitch McConnell looks like an idiot. I look like a hero. Of course I'm going to come forward and make a statement. And that's what's being missed here. The Republicans would be so much smarter to just not say a darn thing. Brian Kemp would be so much smarter to not say a darn thing, because this guy, this is where this whole thing is moving to. And, and this is a part that I don't think the Republican Party understands. They don't want to understand it. It's like, it's, it's like scouting, it's like moving to analytics, right? Instead of just, oh, I have a feeling about this quarterback. No, you got to move to analytics. Georgia is moving to analytics. This is no longer a state that you can just win it by throwing out some culture war stuff, driving around a pickup truck and going to cookout, right? And, and grabbing some Zaxby's. You can't just gut your way through running that state anymore. There's too many different kinds of people. There's too much money. You might be able to pull that off in Texas. Maybe you can pull that off in Florida, but you can't pull that off everywhere in the country anymore. And as the Republicans recognize that they don't have any real policy other than we dislike gay people and we dislike trans kids and we dislike black people and we want to stop 0.000% of trans girls from being able to run and track, as they're realizing that that can only take you so far, they decide to pick a fight with large economic entities that they shouldn't be messing with. It's sheer lunacy. I'm here for it because I'm highly entertained, right? <laughs> and like I said, I can't wait for Gatorade and yeah. everybody else to get involved, but it's stupid. No, it's just interesting how Georgia is this battleground state in a different respect because this is obviously a national issue. With I think it's all but three states by one tally have introduced uh, some form of a voter suppression type bill. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before we pivot, I will say one thing. All three of us could agree that Zaxby's is the chicken king, right? And I say this as a New Orleans Thank guy you. coming Yo. from Popeyes. I grew Thank up on Popeyes. You. Zaxby's cannot be touched. Yes. I love that. Zaxby's, I love that. Zaxby's that, is that, the I love truth. that reference. I love the reference, but I hate the reference because, you know, obviously, I'm, now I'm starting to think about it. <laughs> you know, now, now I'm getting hungry here. So, uh, I said Zaxby's, and, I was like, because I, I just can't get it right now. I can't sandwich. get it. Yes, yeah. yes. Oh, man. Zaxby's, I mean, yes. Zax, and the Zaxby's sauce and, and their fries Ooh. are like the truth. And usually I'm anti crinkle cut from like a fast food place, but their crinkle yeah. cut fries are mm. the best. So if Zaxby's is watching, yo, Come my way. Look at you. Come my try, way. Tag me. Trying to get the hook up. <laughs> I'm, I'm Look, give me you know, listen, I, 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 grew up in, I grew up in New Orleans. I raised on Popeyes and, and, and uh, what you call it? Um, raising Cane right. is right yes, down the yes, road yes, from me. King. Yes. You know yes. what I'm saying? So I know chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm telling you, Zaxby's <laughs> is the way to go. I am so happy that three black dudes just had a chicken conversation. Um, yes. It's good to smile. And, and it's good to We're here for it. It's, it is good. We're here yes. for it. <laughs> right. How did, how did you know that I did, How did you know that I was going to order the chicken? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean I was. No, but, 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 <laughs> right. But Jason, no, all, all citizens, man, I, I wanted to make you laugh, and I'm glad to see you smile, and you're always, um, you know, smiling through it all. But I know this is a very difficult time uh, for you in particular. Uh, one of your dear colleagues uh, passed away, Midwin Charles, uh, legal analyst for both CNN and MSNBC, 47 years old, uh, passed away. And want to just give you the opportunity to reflect on, on her life and her career and the relationship that you were able to have with her. So I, I will say this. I'm going to make sure I'm straightening this out here. I don't know what's going on with the camera. Um, I will say this, uh, and I, I, wrote, I wrote an obit, which was really hard to do uh, in the griot. Uh, Midwin was a real one. And I mean, I, I've, I've, in, in my experience outside of academia, in my experience in media, I, most people who I've met are, are pretty cool. But there's certain people that you really click with. There's certain people who are just so down. There's certain people that, like, whenever you do a TV hit, you know, you you check your text messages because they're going to send you the loudest yes. They're going to send you the DM. They're going to text you and be like, who I got to fight? And Midwin, Midwin was that person, right? And, you know, what I wrote about is, is how much she was loved within our profession. Like, everybody was like, yo, like, you know, we, we, we want to give her more flowers. She was great on TV. We wanted her to get signed and everything else like that. She was a wonderful daughter. She was the primary caregiver for her parents. 
She tried to, I, I, I have to mention this. I was on earlier today uh, with the Clay Kane show and we were just talking about what a light she was and how friendly she was, how funny we were. And we were both relating the fact that Midwin had tried to set us up with friends of hers because that was her thing. Midwin wanted everybody that had love. Mm. She was just, like, she was like, you know, she she had the gay brothers for Clay. She had some sisters for me. She's like, I just want you guys to be happy, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Like she was, she was that person. And so, yeah. and, and I'll say, you know, we had, you know, we had Tiffany on last week. Real talk, when we talk about guests, right, not, not the host of the show, the mm -hmm. only person who I did more media with, when you consider TV and radio and Instagram, the only person who I've done more media with in my career is Tiffany. After that, it was Midwin. Midwin and I were on, t were, were like on TV, on radio, a lot. And I, I, I say this as, as, I, as I wrote, in my obit, and as I tell everybody out there, it is a cliche, but I'm gonna tell you all the truth. Give people flowers when you can. Call a friend, call a coworker who just makes you laugh. Tell them that you love them. Tell them that they're cool. Just tell them that they're fly, like one last time. Because you don't know when that last time will be. I don't have, I don't have any of the the the, the guilt that comes from not telling Midwin how awesome she was when she was here. Yeah, but I man. have the pain of knowing yeah. I'll never be able to tell her again. So, and thank you guys, because it, it's, uh, uh, it's, been, it's been rough. Thank you, Jason. Beautiful words. We appreciate you. Uh, words. Yeah, man. And, um, uh, and especially the, the reminder, because it's, it's not just that, it just, it just occurred to me too. It's like, it's not just that you don't know when you'll see them again and be able to tell them how you feel. But tomorrow's not promised for us either. We right. may not have the chance to tell them how we feel about them. You know what I mean? Right. So it's like, hey, if something, if I'm not here tomorrow, know that I love you, Michael Holly. Know that I love right. you, Jason Johnson. You know, so no, man, like, uh, I, I wish, I, 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 just in your remembrance of her, felt like I knew her, and I didn't. Yeah. You know, but right. she sounded, she sounded just like you described her, like a real one, man. And so... We're sorry. Uh, our condolences go, go. Our condolences go out to her family, her colleagues, her friends, and loved ones uh, like you. And, and we knew her through you, man. So uh, we appreciate you remembering her with us. And uh, rest in All peace right. for sure. So, Thanks, guys. All right, brother, man. Well, uh, appreciate. Thank you. It. Love uh, y'all both. There, and uh, we appreciate you. Love you. Love you, Doc man. Johnson. Love you. Keep, keep, keep pushing. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. All right, man. All right. Hey, thanks for watching Brother From Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.